In this video, I want to show you a few examples of successful language revitalization. The task might appear daunting. How do we help revitalize the language that children don't speak anymore that might be on the verge of being lost? Well, many people are currently working to revitalize languages. And I want to show you very briefly three successful examples. The Hebrew language in Israel, the Maori language in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and Wampanoag from Massachusetts. So Hebrew, believe it or not, nobody spoke Hebrew for about 2000 years. By the time Jesus was alive, his language was probably Aramaic and Hebrew was most likely a liturgical language, something like Latin. So by the mid 1800s, people could read Hebrew and understood it, but only as uh, a sacred language, like you would learn Latin in school. Nobody spoke it. Uh, certainly children weren't born speaking it. Um, someone called uh, Eliezer Ben Yehuda in the late 1800s uh, helped propel a movement to bring Hebrew back to people's homes. People were beginning to emigrate to Israel and they needed a lingua franca between them because many people spoke um, Yiddish, many people spoke German, Russian, Polish, and so there needed to be one language to emerge, emerge as the communication language for all of these people coming to Israel. He proposed that it be Hebrew, which many people at first thought was really weird because Hebrew was like Latin. It lacked many words for modern life. Uh, all you had were religious texts. How could children possibly speak this? He tried when um, uh, the Ben Yehuda son was born. He became the first uh, native speaker of modern Hebrew and uh, Ben Yehuda had to invent a bunch of new words for new things. He said that whenever he wanted to ask for coffee with sugar, he would have to say, give me that thing with that thing and then other thing. People believed in the project and eventually helped invent new words, borrowed words from languages like Arabic, for example, from Yiddish. And slowly, um, people who uh, started speaking Hebrew daily had children and these children were then uh, native speakers of Hebrew, L1 speakers of Hebrew. During the early 20th century, this process continued until it, be it became large enough that children who um, were born with Hebrew went to schools that were taught in Hebrew, and then they had to go to things like university and government. When uh, there was a university that eventually came to be uh, known as the Technion, it was founded in um, the mid-1910s. In 1913, there was an event called the Language Wars in Israel, where people debated whether this new university would, uh, maybe it would be better to have it teach in German, because German was the language of science and technology. He would have Einstein when the Technion was opening. And so why not use it instead of having to invent all these words for Hebrew? But people insisted that Hebrew might be a good language for this university. And it helped um, establish it in the university, but also bring it to government and to eventually every corner of the life of Israel. Now, as you can see, we have um, soda in Hebrew, we have road signs in Hebrew, and there's about 9 million people who speak it. But there was nobody who spoke Hebrew as, a, as an L1 language 150 years ago. It was because the community got together to try to create new speakers of the language and in this way, bring Hebrew back to being a living, everyday language. Let's go to the other side of the planet, to Aotearoa, New Zealand. This is a sign written in the Maori language of New Zealand. In 1840, the Maori community of New Zealand signed a treaty with Britain, um, establishing the conditions for the, uh, the British remaining in the country. During the next century, Ma the Maori language was slowly displaced from the life of the country. All the schools were in English. Um, many people spoke the language, but they couldn't get any education in it, for example. And by um, the 1950s, only about 25% of the Maori populations could speak the language, whereas 50 years ago, everyone could speak it. So groups of interest starting to develop, like the Maori Women's Welfare League, uh, to try to create schools where children could learn to read and write in Maori and hopefully people could learn to, to use the language again. By the 1980s, the situation was so critical that they invented a concept called the language nest. 
which I told you about in a previous video. It's grandparents teaching directly to the grandkids. And through these kinds of projects and pressure um, to the government, they eventually passed laws to help fund Maori training programs throughout the country. As you can see, uh, yeah, on the left, we have an illustration from a language nest. And uh, in the current day, there's still pressure to try to get more resources for Maori training. There's pressure to, for example, change the signs on the streets to have names for streets and landmarks in the Maori language. And while there has been strong official pressure to make sure that the language is considered a treasure um, of the country, and is therefore well funded, and Maori communities have fundings to run their schools, the the progress still continues. For example, last year they were debating whether all schools in the country should have Maori lessons for the children. But as you can see, they've made an effort to restart intergenerational transmission and to have political power to keep the movement going. One last example I want to show you is from the language Wampanoag, which is spoken in Massachusetts. Um, it was probably the, the language that people spoke about that story where Native Americans taught Europeans how to farm in the Americas. The Wampanoag language was spoken in the 1600s, and there were Bibles, for example. There were many letters written in the language. However, uh, late, early in the 1800s, the language was displaced. People stopped speaking it. They transitioned into English to the point where the language um, stopped being spoken by the community. It became dormant. About 150 years later, there was a woman called Jessie Littledo who she said she had a dream about her ancestors told her that she needed to bring the language back to life. She did a master's in linguistics and her master's was making a dictionary of Wampanoag which she made from all of those old letters because that was the only record there was of the language. She had to rebuild new words out of um, extrapolation of what neighboring languages would make her language sound like. And like, when, uh, as she was doing this, she founded a school to teach Wampanoag to the children in the community, and she had a child. And this person was the first native speaker of Wampanoag in more than a hundred years. So as you can see, it takes, uh, it can also be like an individual wanting to make a difference for languages to be revitalized again. An individual with a lot of drive and a lot of determination. So as you can see, there are communities that have managed to revitalize their languages. And keys to their effort are, um, to their successes are an attempt to create new speakers being able to have resources and political power to provide spaces for the language in schools, in society, and um, a lot of determination and hard work.